we tell you what the biggest measure of success for the 2023 Buccaneers is. That and more on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. Your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome into this Tuesday episode of Locked On Bucks, your daily podcast covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We want to thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first listener view every single day. And don't forget, you can subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter. I am James Yarko at JYarko underscore Bucks. He is David Harrison at DHarrison82. Credentialed members of the media covering the Buccaneers. I am the deputy editor of SB Nation's BucksNation.com. David is a staff writer over at BucksGameDay.com, Sports Illustrated's fan nation site covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We are here with you every Monday through Friday, along with our everydayers. And as always, we want to share our appreciation for your continued support of the show. This episode of Locked On Bucks brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to BirdDogs.com slash LockedOnNFL or use the promo code LockedOnNFL when you check out for a free water bottle with any order. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you, and we also promise you, you don't want to turn this off because we are going to talk about a few things on today's episode of Locked On Bucks. We're going to list three of the most important Buccaneers on each side of the ball. So six total, three from each side of the ball. I'm going to list two defensive players, and then I'll add one offensive player. James is going to list two offensive players, and then I'll add the guy that he should have added in the first place. But before we get to that, we first have to contextualize this conversation because if we're going to talk about who the most important player is on both sides of the ball or the most important three players are on both sides of the ball for a successful Buccaneers 2023 campaign, we have to first define what a successful 2023 season looks like, right? Because I think bottom line up front, James, you heard Bruce Arians say it when he was coaching the Arizona Cardinals, you only do this for one reason, to get a ring. You do it to win a Super Bowl, right? So that is the only measure of success. And certainly some people are going to say that. but If that was really true, if winning Super Bowls was really the only measure of success in the NFL, then John Harbaugh would not have a job with the Baltimore Ravens after not winning one for nine seasons. Mike Tomlin wouldn't have a job with the Pittsburgh Steelers for not winning one in 14 seasons and not being to one for 12. So in reality, while everybody wants to win a Super Bowl, and certainly that is the ultimate measure of success, it's not the only measure of success. So This conversation to me, James, is all about expectation management, right? Some people expect the Buccaneers to have the number one overall pick next year. They're not the Arizona Cardinals, so that's not going to happen. But what is the measure of success for a Buccaneers team in 2023, according to you, James Yarko? I I think the best way to measure the success of this team, given the losses that they've had to the roster, the additions that they've made to the roster, the amount of young talent that has made the 53 man roster. You know, we're talking, what is it like 13 or 14 first or second year players? You know, there's a lot of youth on this team. And with youth comes what? Inexperience. So yeah. a lot of this is going to be kind of a learning situation. And probably the most important first year guy on the Buccaneers is going to be Dave Canales, the offense coordinator who is calling plays for the first time in his career. So my measure of success, and yes, I truly believe that this team going eight and nine is potentially a successful season, depending on how it all plays out, but they need to be competitive. They can't be going out there getting shellacked by 20 points. They need to be in these games. They need to be in the hunt within striking distance of either a wild card spot or the division come Thanksgiving weekend. And then you can kind of go from there because This isn't going to be a well-oiled machine right out of the gate. This is Baker Mayfield kind of on his last opportunity. You have contract disputes and issues with key players like Mike Evans, Devin White, Antoine's coming up on an extension, Tristan Wirfs is coming up on it. You have all of these different things playing together. So having Todd Bowles coach a team with a brand new rookie offensive coordinator and almost half of the roster being changed over. You just look for them to be competitive. You know, Mm -hmm. do I expect them to beat the Eagles or the Bills? No, absolutely not. 
but don't go on primetime television like you did against the Falcons about 10 years ago and lose 56 to seven or whatever it was. Don't, you know, or 38 to three against the Saints. So be in these games, show growth throughout the season. And then I think that would be a successful, you know, year given all the change. Yeah. So you're close. You're close yeah. to the mark of success for this Buccaneer squad. So I will applaud you for that. You got very, very close. But I'm going to speak for the Glazers. Okay. I'm going to speak for the Glazers. And I'm also going to do what the Glazers are going to do and hold Jason Light specifically accountable for the words that he has been speaking for the last three or four years. And that is what? That is that this Buccaneers roster had talent before Tom Brady. And then this Buccaneers roster has talent after Tom Brady. Well, let me tell you something. If your roster has talent before and after Tom Brady, then you should be a playoff team. And the Glazers are not interested in not competing for championships anymore. Now, again, this doesn't mean you have to go to the NFC Championship game. It doesn't mean you have to go to the Super Bowl. But you can't say you had a good time at the prom if you weren't even in the building. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers cannot say they're competing for championships if you're not even in the playoffs. Bottom line. And so I think for the Glazers, they're not interested in rebuilding. If they're interested in rebuilding, they would rebuild. You don't rebuild by keeping everything in the house that you already had. You get rid of your old furniture, get rid of your old appliances that aren't working for you anymore, and you get new ones. The Glazers didn't do that. They kept their appliances. In my analogy, the appliances are Jason Light, Todd Bowles, and the majority of the coaching staff that Todd Bowles decided to keep, and they kept their furniture, which are the players. Therefore, the Glazers still think this is a championship house. Why? Because they're being told that this can be a championship house. Now, am I saying that if they don't make the playoffs, everybody's getting fired? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I think that for the Glazers, they're not interested in going back to the Yucks. They're not interested in going back through what they went through after the John Gruden Super Bowl, where they went a decade plus with nothing. They want to stay relevant. They want to the Buccaneers to stay relevant in the sports conversation. And that, to me, is going to be the measure they use for success for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So I think when we talk about the Buccaneers, uh, we have to use the same measure as well. So to me, that is what this is. is playoffs or nothing. If you don't make the playoffs, this season was an abject failure. Because if you're not planning on making the playoffs, why go get Baker Mayfield? You know what I'm saying? Why go spend money on a veteran quarterback if you're not even planning on going to the postseason with them? If you're not doing that, you should be resetting this whole thing, which means you either roll Kyle Trask to see what he can do for a year. If he's great, great. If he's not, welcome to Tampa Caleb Williams. You know what I'm saying? And we kind of have these conversations during the offseason as well. So for me, that is the answer. Everybody out there, you'll have your own answers. Some people will sit there and say, it's Super Bowl or nothing. Every year you don't win the Super Bowl, you're a loser. You're the first or you're last. Like, and then that's perfectly fine. But James, you have your measure of success. I have my measure of success. The good news is they're relatively close. So our list of players who are the most important players to Buccaneers success should be relatively within the same ballpark as well. We'll find out coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Bucks, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked On Bucks is brought to you by Bird Dogs, whose stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. My co-host, James Jarko, is wearing Bird Dogs, and as you can tell, he has a truly sculpted look. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs achieves this by using cloud and knit fabric that they literally invented for their product line. I'm sorry, guys, James Jarko is not going to stick his butt in the frame for you to see his shorts, but he is actually wearing Bird Dog shorts. And they are very comfortable. Uh, they look just like khaki, but they stretch. So you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. The best part is bird dogs are functional for any occasion. I've worn bird dogs to training camp, to dinner, to the pool, lazing around the house on a rare day off. And I already I already told you, every day, I wear my favorite pair of bird dogs joggers religiously when I'm traveling for road games because I don't look lazy wearing them, but I'm also comfortable. And even on trips from the east to the west coast, they're still comfortable the entire time. And of course, every day is already know I take this beautiful bird dogs tumbler with me everywhere that I go. If you miss the tumbler, I'm sure it'll be back someday. But right now you can go to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL or use the promo code locked on NFL at checkout and you'll get a free bird dogs water bottle with your order that James and I are both very, very uh, anxiously waiting and looking forward to using that bad boy. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NFL for a free water bottle at checkout. You'll take that everywhere with you, and you won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you. Thanks for making Lockdown Bucks your first listen or view today and every day. Every day is make sure you come back tomorrow because James and bird dogs enthusiast Evan Klosky of WTSP 10 Tampa Bay 
will be coming back through for WTSP Wednesday here in the first game week of the regular yeah, season. Yeah. In the meantime. Oh, oh, get get the yeah button ready again because Evan just texted me right before we started recording and said, uh, we're going to have the Locked On Bucks burning question of the week on the Blitz every Sunday morning on 10 Tampa Bay. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, on top of all that, we've also got a locked on ultimate NFL season yeah! preview. That seven episode. Okay, I'm not going to do that again. That's getting annoying. The seven episode extravaganza brings opinions, analysis, and plenty of debate from all 32 of our locked on NFL hosts with added insights from our national experts. It's a can't miss series before the season kicks off. Catch every episode of Locked On NFL on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. If you're listening to Locked On Bucks, it's literally in the audio feed. Uh, if you're watching on Locked On Bucks, it's literally in our video feed. So you can go find it wherever you want to see it. And we, Locked On Bucks, will be dropping our final regular season record projections and team superlatives at 6 p.m. Eastern uh, Saturday live. So make sure you come through for that so you can check out our record projections, uh, tell us where we're wrong, and check out our superlatives and tell us where we're wrong. Uh, and we're doing all that as we get set for the Buccaneers' first upset win of the year, James, over the Minnesota Vikings. Or will it be the first upset win of the year? Come through Saturday, and we will tell you. Yeah! Okay, for real, last one. Who yeah. are the most important Buccaneers to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers having a successful season? James says it can be eight or nine wins as long as there's growth and, and faith for the future. And honestly, I would be happy with that as well, personally. I say the Glazers aren't interested in any of that 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 mess. They want playoffs or nothing. Uh, so excluding quarterbacks, James, you're going to kick us off with an offensive player. Who are the most important Buccaneers to getting those eight or nine promising developmental wins in your book? Yeah, number one, right off the bat, it's running back Rashad White. <clears throat> and I am going to bring to you, our loyal everydayers, a classic David Harrison number dump. That's what we're about to do right now. So you take a look at where Dave Canales came from, right? He wasn't calling all the shots in Seattle, but a lot of that offense is now being implemented in Tampa. So last year for the Seattle Seahawks, they had 572 pass attempts. 425 rushing attempts. That means they ran the ball 42.6% of the time, and they racked up 2,042 rushing yards and 12 touchdowns. Now you break that down even further. Who was their number one running back last season? It was Kenneth Walker III. He had 228 attempts. That's 53.6% of all rushing attempts in Seattle were Kenneth Walker. That accounted for 1,050 yards and nine of those 12 touchdowns. He also added 27 receptions, which was 39.7% of receptions by the running backs for 165 yards, no touchdowns. So that means that on 20.5% of all offensive snaps, the running backs were getting the ball. So Kenneth Walker III was on the field for 52.6% of all offensive snaps. They did still rotate running backs, but over half of them, Kenneth Walker th III was on the field. When he was on the field, he had a 44.3% touch rate. That means of all the snaps where Walker was on the field, he touched the ball almost half the time. There is no player in the Dave Canales offense that is going to translate to being anywhere close to as important or as involved as Rashad White will, both in the run game and in the passing game. We are talking about one player that's not a quarterback that is getting almost 45% of the touches on offense. That is insane. He is vital to the success of the Buccaneers. Uh, no lies detected. That's, that is a very solid case for what is happening uh, with the also, Tampa Buccaneers this year. haven't had your fantasy draft yet, draft Rashad White. He's going to get the ball so much. Yeah. I wasn't able to draft Rashad White in my money league. I did try to trade for him. Uh, the guy that I tried to trade for him from, huge Bucks fan. He has Rashad White, Chris Godwin, Kay Dotton, Trey Palmer, and Baker Mayfield. That's too many. I hate to tell him, but that's going to lose him a lot of fantasy games. But yeah. 
too many. Uh, kudos, kudos to the fandom. You know what I mean? But yeah, he won't trade Rashad White for anything. Uh, I even offered him Austin Eckler and uh, Christian McCaffrey, and he wouldn't do it. I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. Yeah, there's no um, <laughs> I, I would like to think he would do that if I actually had had those players and offered them. All right, so very solid start. Uh, number one offensive, most important offensive player to the Buccaneers' success this year, Rashad White. I certainly think a lot of people are going to agree with that and uh, good numbers there. And, and you're right, I do like numbers. So my first defensive player, and again, I'm not counting quarterbacks, is defensive sure. tackle Vita Vea. I just, I just paused so everybody could, could finish laughing because I was hilarious. Um, Vita Vea last year played 539 snaps, the second most snaps on the defensive line behind Rakeem Nunez Rochez. Why did Rakeem Nunez Rochez uh, have more snaps? And if you want to pause this and go check my work, absolutely go check because I was shocked. Um, it's because Vita Vea missed some time, right? He missed some games, unfortunately, and that happens in the NFL season. But Vita Vea still led the team in sacks, which shows that even though he had fewer snaps, his snaps are obviously worth more. And that's what we're talking about here is worth to the team, right? If he played the entire season, Vita Vea was on pace to have seven and a half sacks, which would have been a team record for defensive tackles getting sacks in a season and beating, well, his own record because six and a half was still the record of defensive tackles getting sacks in a single season for the Buccaneers, outpacing Gerald McCoy's six sacks from 2018. Remember him? He used to be good for uh, for quite a while for uh, at one point in time. Um, so Vita Vea already the best defensive tackle in Buccaneers history. I think you can already book that. And Ooh. if he's the best defensive tackle in Buccaneers history, he's obviously got to be one of the most important players on this team. When you look at what the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are trying to do, if you can get past my veiled shot at Gerald McCoy, which was a joke, I'm sorry if I offended anybody. Um, the Buccaneers have spent two years, not just one year, Two years. Go back to last year's combine, too. They spent two seasons wanting to improve their organic pass rush. What does the organic pass rush mean? It means your front. Now, the Buccaneers' traditional, quote-unquote, 3-4 defense, you would think three-man uh, down linemen. And yes, to a certain extent, that's true. But you also have to count the two outside linebackers because more times than not, they're pass rushing or they're coming in uh, some sort of pass rush set before dropping off pass coverage, right? So really, you're talking about those five guys. So the efforts that they've made to try to improve the pass rush from those three to five players is bringing Logan Hall. That hasn't worked too great. They brought in Joe Tryon Schwenka. That's worked in spurts really well, but in other times, not so good. They've tried to develop Anthony Nelson. I still don't see it. They see it, obviously, and from time to time, certainly this preseason, he showed flashes of it. Shaquille Barrett was a thing, but then injuries caught up to him, and we'll see how he does this season. So basically around every corner, what could go wrong for the Buccaneers improving the organic pass rush has gone wrong, except for Vita Vea. So this year, they bring in Kalijah Kansi. Shaq Barrett is healthy. Joe Tryon Schwenka looks like maybe he's getting it put together. Logan Hall has another year. Anthony Nelson had a really good preseason. Greg Gaines, the veteran, comes in from Los Angeles to be a valuable rotational player. So again, the Buccaneers are going out and they're making a lot of effort to try to get this organic pass rush before you bring in Levante, before you bring in Devin, Antoine, Carlton, anybody from the secondary. Let's just get home with our base set. They're doing the effort. Vita Vea absolutely has to maintain his level of production. And I say that with the emphasis because I'm not saying he has to have six and a half sacks, has to have seven and a half sacks, but maintain your production in terms of disrupting the opposing offensive line. If Vita Vea can do that, then maybe this rest of this, this pass rush has a chance. Well, I'll tell you right now, if Vita Vea falls off for some reason, this pass rush is going nowhere because it all starts with him as evidenced by last year when he had a record setting season for this team. And the pass rush was still non-existent at, at very large portions of the season. So if Vita Vea is not going, nobody's going. This defensive pass rush only goes where the nose tackle takes it. Uh, you heard it here first. David Harrison says Vita Vea is better than Warren Sapp and Leroy Selman and is now a slam dunk for Wow, the I wasn't even going pull. there, actually. You know what? That's a better <laughs> pull. I was literally just staying with Gerald McCoy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I already said it was a joke, so get over it. Listen to no. the rest of it. Too, too late. Too late. You already said it. All right. Uh, my uh, second most important player on offense. I'm not going to be quite as long winded on this one, but it's Robert Hainsey, the center filling in for Ryan Jensen, who is the only player outside of the quarterback that touches the ball on every single snap, the center. So you have a guy now starting his second year, but on the right side of him, this also kind of includes Cody Malk and Luke Gedeke. But you have a guy who is lining up next to a rookie. It's only his second year starting at this position. He has to be an anchor. He cannot be a liability and allow pass rush up the middle. He has to be able to be that guy 
that can take care of his business and make sure that Cody Malk is adjusting and developing and not letting pass rush through to get after Baker Mayfield. This guy cannot afford to slip up or have slow games or have weak games. He cannot be the Donovan Smith of centers for this offensive line. It absolutely can't happen or it's going to derail everything. Not just the pass game. It's going to affect Rashad White. It's going to affect Sean Tucker. It's going to affect uh, Chase Edmonds. I guess Keyshawn Vaughn too, but he messes up enough on his own. Um, so Robert Hainsey being quite literally the centerpiece of the offensive line is also vital to the Buccaneers' success. Yeah. You know what you just made me realize? That I'm awesome? That stat head literally did not list Warren Sapp as a Buccaneers D tackle because I looked at, I literally looked it up and it said that Vita Vea had the most sacks of a defense tackle in Buccaneers history, but you just brought up Warren Sapp because my brain, when I started talking trash, wasn't even going that far in history, <laughs> but you just made me realize that my stat head search was incorrect. But either way, Vita Vea had six and a half sacks, certainly a very good output, but yes, obviously Warren yeah, Sapp had no many more than six and a half sacks many more times. So I'm glad you brought it up. Even in jest, it actually brought up a valuable point, but I think my point on Vita Vea still stands. Uh, my second defensive player, Antoine Winfield Jr., and I'm just going to lay out some numbers for you because we've already talked about Antoine extensively every day, as you know that. If you missed my uh, deeper dive in Antoine Winfield Jr., go back to yesterday's episode where I listed him as one of the best players on this Buccaneers roster. Uh, without Antoine Winfield Jr. last year, the Buccaneers gave up 3.9 points per game more on average. That's four points. That's over a field goal. So you're essentially talking a possession plus. Without him, the Buccaneers defense gave up a 106.2 QBR. With him, that dropped to 88.7. Still not a good QBR against, but much better than 106.2, right? Without Antoine Winfield Jr. on the field, 4.6 yards per carry surrendered. With him, 3.9, so almost a full yard per carry. Antoine Winfield Jr. makes a difference on this defense. You absolutely have to have him. Uh, and good news is, return to practice on Monday, so maybe he's going to be on the field to help them upset his dad's former team, the Minnesota Vikings. All right, we each have one more player. We're going to tack one onto each other's list. That is coming up next on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. Today's episode of Locked on Bucks is also brought to you by FanDuel. Get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. If you take David's advice, you'll drop all 200 of those bonus bets on Washington to beat the Cardinals. I I would I would do that. Uh just go money line. Don't be cute. Then all of your winnings are going to turn into cash money as long as David isn't wrong and the Commanders return to being the laughing stock of the NFL after losing to Josh Dobbs and uh an Isaiah Simmons list Cardinals defense. Plus, all the customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. David and I both took advantage of the new multi-view during college football Saturday. And let me tell you, that was fantastic. And we haven't even gotten to the Sunday ticket portion of multi-view yet. So now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use and you can be on, you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you don't want to miss. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Wrapping things up here on a Tuesday edition of Locked On Bucks podcast. And David, we've named two, well, I've named two players on offense. You've named two players on defense. But let's keep it going. Let's go back to the offensive side of the ball and let's find out which player you had to resort to for the offense uh, because my first two picks were obviously the 101 and the 102 in just sheer perfection. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I refreshed my stat head search. And sometimes if you just use stat head, you know, sometimes you have to redo your searches. That's my fault for not catching it. But Vita Vea, six and a half sacks, the most since 2016 um, by, by a Buccaneers defensive lineman. So there that is. My offensive player that I'm contribute to this list, though, James, wide receiver Chris. Godwin. And truth be told, I actually was going to go wide receiver Mike Evans, but something kind of dawned on me. And here's here's what dawned on me. Mike Evans obviously great, and his impact is certainly invaluable, right? But when you look at offensive teams in, in history, and no, I have not looked at every single offensive team in the history of the National Football League because 
there's not enough time in the day or the week or the year to really do that, right? But when you look at some of the most prolific offensive performances in National Football League history, some of the best receivers in NFL history, most of them, if not all of them, don't see the great career experience or career success that they want unless they have a number two. So in some ways, that number two is just as, if not, maybe, sometimes, especially game to game, more important than that number one. It's almost like we always say the best ability is availability, right? Having the most talent in the world doesn't help you if you're in the trainer room. Well, having a number one receiver on the field doesn't help you unless you have a number two to take advantage of all the attention the defense is going to spend to that number one guy. We turn to Randy Moss. Every time we talk about Mike Evans, we talk about who? Randy Moss, right? Because he smoked his career record for starting NFL uh, career with 1,000 yards receiving, right? Randy Moss in 2004 had his first non-thousand yard receiving season. He missed three games that season. He had a career low in receptions at the time. I think career low actually ever in, in his career and also had his career low in yards because it was the first non-thousand yard season. Now, in that year, you would think the Minnesota Vikings had a record of what? Not very good. Well, it turns out they went eight and eight, which not great, but not terrible. But they were also second place in the NFC North for context, so pretty good in the division standings. And they actually won a wild card game over the Green Bay Packers before losing the divisional round of the playoffs to the Philadelphia Eagles. So not a bad team, despite the fact that Randy Moss failed to reach 1,000 yards, in part because he missed three games. Why did that happen? Why were the Minnesota Vikings still able to be successful? Because, James, that result, granted the Bucs can't go 8-8, eight and eight, unless they go 8-1, eight and one, but that result would be success in both of our books, right? If you win at least eight games, you make the playoffs, you're successful for both of our, our stories. Nate Burleson, that season, number two receiver for the Minnesota Vikings, had a career-high 68 receptions, career-high at the time, and a career-high forever, 1,000 yards plus six receiving. His only 1,000-yard receiving season, Nate Burleson in 2004. So right when the Minnesota Vikings needed a number two receiver to take advantage of all the opportunities that Randy Moss provided him, Nate Burleson showed up, and he had a career-high nine receiving touchdowns at the same time. Is Jerry Rice Jerry Rice without John Taylor? He may still be Jerry Rice, but is he real? Is he full Jerry Rice without John Taylor? Larry Fitzgerald and Anquan Bolden, Marvin Harrison and Reggie Wayne. All the greats that also have great success, right? So not just personal success, but team success, have a running mate. On the other side, Steve Largent, 14 years, arguably the best receiver the Seattle Seahawks have ever seen. Sorry, DK. Sorry, Tyler Lockett. 14 years playing, four playoff appearances. I think maybe two wins in that stretch. Calvin Johnson, Hall of Famer, one of the greatest receivers to ever play, arguably maybe the most physically talented receiver to ever play the game. That's arguable, uh, debatable. Nine years in the league, two playoff appearances. His best Lions team, 2014, Golden Tate, 90-plus receptions, 1,000-plus yards. Not just because Calvin Johnson did by himself, but because he had that number two to take advantage of what that number one provided. Chris Godwin taking advantage of what Mike Evans provides. More important, ironic, like, it's kind of weird because, like, more important that maybe what Mike Evans is bringing, but of course you don't have that without Mike Evans. So it's like the chicken and the egg, which one comes first. But that's why I decided to go Chris Godwin because it lets me highlight both guys so I get to cheat and put two guys on the list. Boop! Well, and, and that's a great point, and I'll bring up a couple of other examples. One of them is in Tampa. The Bucks had Keyshawn Johnson, but they didn't get over the hump until they got Keenan McCardo. You, you take a look. You know, at I was the, actually going to try to find a way to work Joe Juravicious in this conversation. And I oh, really I love Joe Juravicious. Uh, then you take a look at, you know, the, the dominant. I use that term loosely because, you know, they never won a playoff game. But the Cincinnati Bengals with Carson Palmer and Chad Johnson or Chad Ochocinco, whatever you want to call him, and TJ Hushmanzada. You know, TJ Hushmanzada was able to flourish because of the attention that Chad Johnson brought on. Then the Raiders mm -hmm. decide to pay Hushmanzilli, you know, five billion dollars to come be their number one wide receiver, and he falls off the face of the earth. So the two complement each other beautifully. Uh, I do think that Chris Godwin would be successful as a number one, whether it's in Tampa or elsewhere. You know, he wouldn't sure. have that Hushmanzada fall off. But you know, it, it continues to to show that these guys need one another. Uh, open your checkbook, Glazers, and give Mike Evans the money. Uh, my defensive guy to add to your list is uh, outside linebacker Joe Tryon Shoyinka. So this is a guy I've talked about him a lot, so I'm not going to drag this out too far. But eight career sacks, 11 tackles for loss You know, in, in his short career so far. And I've harped about he, he gets the pressure, he just doesn't get the finishes. You know, he had 48 total pressures in 2022. And 
four sacks. So he only had an 8.3% closing rate. You take a look at the Buccaneers as a defense in 2022, uh, 45 sacks. It's pretty good. 17 of them by outside linebackers led by Anthony Nelson, who had five and a half. It's not, not good enough. In 2021, going back one full year, they had 47 sacks as a team, 23 of them by outside linebackers. Barrett led the position group with 10. Joe Tryon Shoyinka, in order for the pass rush to work in unison with the greatest defensive tackle in the history of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Vita Bea, Joe Tryon Shoyinka has to take that next big leap. His success is going to open things up for Shaq, just like you talked about with the wide receivers and how the attention for Mike Evans opens things up for Chris Godwin. The same can be true here, but defenses are not going to respect Shaq Barrett the way they used to until they see that he can still do it after that Achilles injury. So that means Joe Tryon Shoyinka has to step up, has to show them that he can do damage as well for the defense to succeed as a whole, because if they don't have to worry about JTS closing in and actually finishing a play. They're going to put all their attention on Shaq. They're going to put their attention on Levante and Devin as inside blitzers. They're going to put their attention on Antoine Winfield Jr. as a blitzer. They're not going to worry about Tryon Shoyinka because they're going to say, this guy can't close. He's just going to let our quarterback move out of the pocket a couple of steps, find somebody 30 yards down the field. So JTS, I'm begging you, dude, you got to finish plays and you got to do it starting week one against the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah. I mean, I'll throw a name in this conversation, uh, kind of counterpoint ish actually, but uh, Chase Young through two seasons, one more sack, two more tackles for a loss than Joe Tryon Shrinka. So yeah. just, you know, just, just saying next time someone tells you Chase Young is, you know, generational talent. Love you, Chase. Right. Um, <laughs> actually, I do want to throw fantasy football commercial legend, Tishon, Tishon, uh, TJ Hushmanzada. Who's your McDougal's championship? Who's your mama? Who's your mama? TJ, who's your mama? <laughs> All right, that is going to do it for this episode. But again, coming up tomorrow, I will be joined by Evan Klosky of 10 Tampa Bay and 10 Tampa Bay.com. And we are going to start the Vikings previews tomorrow. We're going to start diving in to this game. So make sure you come back for that episode. In the meantime, if you've got questions, comments, reactions, anything at all, you could drop those in the YouTube comments, or of course, you can send them to us on Twitter at Locked On Bucks, at JRCO underscore Bucks, and at DHarrison82. We want to thank you one more time for making Locked On Bucks your first listener view every single day. And until we speak again, be safe, be kind to one another, fire those cannons. And we will see you next time for another episode of Locked on Bucks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. 